Welcome to At The Table. I'm Audrey Galix. Thank you so much for joining us. We're going to be talking about the Coyote Challenge that has been issued in the state of Georgia by the Georgia Department of Natural Resources. And to talk about that is wildlife biologist Charlie Kilmaster. Charlie, thanks for being on At The Table to talk Thank about Thank you for having me. The Coyote Challenge. Uh, what exactly is going on June or March to August of 2017, correct? So we're doing a monthly drawing from March to August, one per month. And in order to uh, enter for a chance to win a lifetime hunting license, you can bring uh, between one and five coyotes to one of our office locations, and that gets you a chance to win the lifetime license. And this is not live coyotes you no. know, on a leash or anything like that. This is uh, an opportunity for people to... Hunt and trap coyotes. Now, as you can imagine, uh, some folks might have a, an issue with that. Why are we doing that when uh, I read that coyotes actually help uh, control the rodent population and the deer population. Is there uh, a looking for a balance or what's what's going on here? That's right. This, uh, there's a balance and really what the the primary goal of this program t uh, is, is to highlight the fact that coyotes can be taken year round. So that's a management tool for people that are experiencing issues with coyotes. They can, um, there's no close season, no bag limits on coyotes and they, much like our other game species, need, uh, game species need to be managed to a certain extent. And you know, here you're a wildlife biologist, I think. A wildlife biologist generally is someone who wants to preserve wildlife. That's you know, sort of the, the goal, but um, obviously uh, this is something that is a necessity the state's found? Well, actually, I, I think a, a better word would be conservation and not preservation. And uh, conservation is, uh, is the wise use of those resources. So um, that entails managing species through, uh, in some cases, lethal, lethal removal. So what are we talking about in terms of the population in the state of Georgia, the coyote? Well, we don't have a uh, exact population estimate. We don't have for many species in the state. It's just uh, something that's, uh, that's hard, to, hard to get a handle on. Um, but we do have trend information, and we do know that coyotes have increased uh, substantially in the state over the last couple of decades, Any especially. Any understanding of why that's happened? Well, we had uh, coyotes are, are a non-native species to Georgia, and they uh, they were introduced in the state uh, over 50 years ago, um, and so you had that population increasing where those uh, where those were brought in, and then we had a uh, more and who, of a who brought them in, or how did they get here? We uh, we think that uh, some fox hunters uh, brought them in back before there were laws prohibiting stocking non-native species and in, into in, in new areas, that sort of thing. And then uh, there was a natural eastward expansion of coyotes uh, in, into the southeast. Hmm. Habitat changes in the north? Or? No, we, uh, we, had a, uh, we used to have a few predators that we don't have in the state, uh, namely the mountain lion and the red wolf. Uh, both of those were extirpated from the state uh, over 100 years ago. So we had this, uh, we had this kind of ecological void there. Does that mean that was killed, they were extirpated? Uh, Killed, killed off, killed uh, off, but not extinct. Oh, okay. they, uh, the red wolf is critically endangered, um, but it's not extinct. And uh, mountain lions, well, the eastern cougar, which did inhabit part of the state, is now extinct. Um, but we do have other subspecies of, of mountain lions, Florida panther, uh, that sort of thing that um, that used to occupy this this area, and they were some of that predation force on. Uh, our prey species within the state. So we have this ecological void that coyotes naturally moved into. So how, how big is the problem? I mean, I you know, think of somebody uh, maybe last year waiting at a, a school bus stop before you know, dawn and maybe saw a coyote or was it a wolf? They weren't really sure. Uh, is that part of the problem, uh, expansion into some urban areas? Well, part, for the urban issues, certainly. Uh, negative interactions with coyotes, coyotes taking pets. Um, attacks on humans are very rare. Um, I would not go out worried about a coyote attack, even knowing that they're around. Send but they, a kid to the bus stop in the morning. And, yeah. Yes, I, that's, uh, I, I wouldn't be overly concerned about that. Um, 
but in most ca in most cases, the only time that that's going to be a concern, uh, like the recent issue in Fulton County, is going to be a rabid coyote, and that could just as easily be a, a rabid raccoon or fox or dog or cat. Uh, so it's not necessarily a concern just with coyotes. So I think a lot of the fears on human attacks are, you know, largely unfounded. Um, but the taking pets is is a concern for a lot of people. So um, that does generate a lot of uh, a lot of concern over coyotes in general, uh, yeah. as as they you know they they readily adapt to a, an urban and suburban lifestyle. And I understand even if you have a fence around and let your you know small dog or cat out in the backyard, that uh, you know that doesn't really keep a coyote out. You're, That's you're correct. Smiling and, you know. <laughs> they they can go over or under a fence pretty readily. A, a standard chain link fence that would hold most dogs in. Now we were talking before we went on camera, and you were mentioning that the a coyote has a tendency to take uh, fawns, or there was a correlation between. Yes, coyotes can have a substantial impact on the deer population through uh, reducing um, the number of fawns that are that are um, that make it to to adulthood. So uh, they're generally not considered an effective predator of adult deer. Um, and fawns, once they reach about a month of age, they're usually pretty safe from coyotes, but it's that first two to four weeks of life where the impacts can be the greatest. And we've seen uh, a fairly substantial decrease in uh, what we call the recruitment rate, the number of fawns that make it into adulthood um, from the, say, the late 1990s until present. And most of that is, is due to coyote predation. Uh, for a time, that was actually very helpful to us in reducing an overabundant deer population. But now that the deer population is, is really at or in some cases below target levels in some areas, um, there's an increased concern amongst the hunters at, uh, at, at more effectively managing coyotes. Now, uh, I understand that there is a correlation between uh, if you remove a co one coyote, that another will take its place potentially, and so does that really? It does that really help the situation? Well, uh, on a individual property, that that certainly can be the case. Um, so, uh, when when you remove a, a resident uh, single or pair of coyotes, you have these transient coyotes that are unpaired, males or females that that uh, are waiting for a nice uh, spot to put up put down roots and, and set up shop. And is that part of it? You see some other evidence of coyotes' presence, like, oh, well, that looks like a you know great apartment for me to move into as well. Sure, sure. And so when you have these, um, you have these dynamics that are going on, so uh, it, it is correct that if you, on an individual property, if you reduce coyote numbers, it's only temporary because they're going to fill back in and they do it rather quickly. But you can use that to your advantage. So when fawns are dropping, we know about when fawns are dropping in late May, early June, depending on where you are in the state, you can remove coyotes at that critical time and keep them at bay until those fawns reach that four weeks of age and can escape predation. And even though they fill back in, you've done, you've, you've accomplished the goal of increasing the number, the number of deer. So is that why the challenge has been issued between March and, was it August? Yes, we didn't wanna, mo most of the coyote harvest that takes place in the state is done uh, by deer hunters while, while deer hunting. And so, uh, but that's not really doing much good as far as, um, uh, it goes for fawns. So we scheduled it at a time to um, to make people aware that they had that management tool uh, at their disposal if they have an issue with coyotes. And not all not all uh, properties are uh, having negative interactions with coyotes. Uh, some some properties coyotes don't impact deer. It's highly variable across the landscape. Now you mentioned before, again, we went on camera that there were a lot of misconceptions, misperceptions about uh, the coyote population. And I was wondering if you could address those. I know we talked a little bit about that. Well, uh, there's a lot of misconceptions. We're not using this program to try to uh, impact the population density of coyotes. We're not trying to substantially reduce the population. We're not trying to eradicate coyotes. We're trying to remind people through this drawing that there's this management tool available to them to, uh, to manage coyotes at that critical time should they do so. Have you yourself uh, been part of a coyote challenge or have you? 
No, I've never participated in uh, in any sort of drawing like this or anything like that. I'm, I, uh, I've, I've taken coyotes, but um, this is uh, this is the first time uh, I've ever been involved in a program such as this, and obviously uh, because of conflicts of interest, I'm barred from participating in it. <laughs> So. Uh -huh. now, and are there any other animals that the state also issues a similar challenge for, or is it no, a coyote? No, uh, this is the this is one of the first ones that that we've done. And I, I'm very curious about your own history getting involved in this. Um, we so, spoke again before we were on camera about how you developed an interest in becoming a wildlife biologist, and I'd love for you to share that with our audience. Okay, sure. Um, my uh, my great uncle was a wildlife biologist and and uh, refuge manager for the Fish and Wildlife Service for over 50 years, and growing up. Uh, from a very young age, listening to his stories about wildlife in this states back to, you know, he came along when all wild, nearly all of our game species have been again extirpated, uh, uh, locally extinct, um, and to some extent, and he was in that in that gr cohort of folks that helped restore wildlife to our to our southeastern United States. So hearing those stories about the restoration of wildlife uh, just really got me interested in it. And what would you tell someone, perhaps, you know, the next generation, you know, coming up uh, about wildlife biology, either as a field or as an interest? I know you said you have two daughters and you take them I out do. into the field. I um, do. I, uh, I love my job. Now, I spend way more time behind a desk than a lot of people would assume for wildlife biologists, but uh, with wildlife management comes a lot of data collection and a lot of data analysis. And data analysis is done with a computer, so you've got to spend some time uh, indoors. But it's uh, it's by far one of the most interesting fields to be in. It's never boring, uh, always something new, and uh, I uh, I can't imagine doing anything else. We just have a minute left. Uh, is there anything that you'd like to share that I didn't ask you about the Coyote Challenge that people should know if they want to participate? What's the best way to find out about it? Um, I would just say uh, go to uh, georgiawildlife.com and you can get all the information you need about uh, what the rules are, uh, particularly in the metro area. There, um, there are going to be a lot of local ordinances on the discharge of firearms, so you got to be very careful. This is not a free license to uh, just shoot a gun in, a, in, a, in an urban or suburban area. You have to be mindful, so you need to check with your uh, your county and city to see what firearms discharge ordinances there may be that uh, that would be applicable to you. you know, I, I just also want to add one of the things that I read when I was uh, researching the, the topic, and, and in particular, uh, my interest was, you know, why are we doing this, uh, was a suggestion that uh, humans learn to live uh, more, you know, collaboratively, and there's got to be a better word for it, but with uh, the coyote. And um, it said that coyotes perhaps get a little bit too comfortable uh, around humans, should not be fed, and that we should learn to um, engage in hazing. I think that was the language. Is there any... Um, certainly, uh, certainly not feeding them. Um, and, uh, you know, that they, they need... Um, it, in order for them not to become too accustomed to humans, they need to have negative interactions with humans um, in, in order to keep them from being uh, too, um, not, not necessarily aggressive, but uh, they, they tend to approach people when they're very um, tamed in a way from, uh, from not having those negative interactions, which can be a concern if one of those individuals does become rabid, they're more apt to come in and around where humans are. So don't feed them, don't shake hands, don't invite them into the house. Sure. Uh, Charlie Kilmaster with the Department of Natural Resources in Georgia talking about the Coyote Challenge. Thanks for being with us at the table. Thank you for having me. Uh, at the table, we'll return in a moment. Stay with us. Welcome back to At The Table. I'm Audrey Galix. Thank you again for being with us. Did you know when you file your Georgia taxes, if you're watching from the state of Georgia, you can help to save wildlife and native plant species? Well, we have someone else from the Department of Natural Resources for the state of Georgia to talk about the Check Off program. Uh, with me is uh, John Ambrose. Dr. John Ambrose is the chief non-game conservation 
official? That's Director? correct. I'm chief of the non-game section. At the Department of Natural Resources. Thanks so much for joining us at the table. This is kind of an exciting thing. I mean, usually when I think of you know, paying taxes, it's not, you know, a little bit of pain involved, but there's an opportunity to do something that maybe is um, pain-free. Absolutely. And uh, certainly at this time of year, we want to make sure that people are aware of the fact that they can uh, make a contribution uh, using either the long form or the short form uh, of Georgia uh, tax form. And look for line 10, is it, on the short form? Line 10 on the short form and line 30, 30 on, the, on the long form. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can make a donation to the Non-Game Wildlife Conservation Fund, which is very important for us. We get uh, only about 6% of our operating budget from the state, so we have to raise a lot of our operating funds, the, the vast majority. Um, and having the Non-Game Fund provides us kind of that base funding that we can use as matching funds for federal grants. So how much money are we talking about that you've perhaps raised in the past from the check off? It varies from year to year. Last year was kind of a low year and it was down close to um, uh, like 131,000. It usually ranges you know, upwards to about 200,000 a year. Um, and um, you know, it, again, that all goes into a protected fund. The funds don't lapse from year to year, so we can use those uh, funds that are, that are gained this year uh, in, in succeeding years. So what kind of wildlife are we talking about? Where is some of the money gone uh, in terms of helping some of the wildlife? Well, we like to say we, we are focused on the more than 95% of Georgia's native wildlife that are not either game animals or sport fish. So everything from right whales uh, off the coast of Georgia to uh, bog turtles in mountain bogs in North Georgia. Um, we work on a, a big initiative for us right now is focusing on conservation of the gopher tortoise, which is Georgia's state reptile and um, is still widespread in South Georgia, but we're trying to conserve populations um, around the state so that that species, which has been petitioned for uh, addition to the uh, endangered species list, does not need to be listed. Well, well tell us a little bit more about the gopher turtle, uh, its habitat, or you know, a little bit more so people can maybe feel a little <coughs> bit more of a connection to it. Well, it's, um, if you drive around South Georgia, you may see these burrows in sandy soil areas. Uh, we call the gopher tortoise a keystone species because it actually provides a home for a lot of other species. It, it digs burrows that are, that are deep, uh, as, as much as 10 feet deep and maybe 14 or 15 feet long. And there are a lot of other uh, species that live in those burrows, the eastern indigo snake, the uh, Florida pine snake, the gopher frog, and a lot of invertebrate species that actually share that burrow with the gopher tortoise. And they all coexist, get along. They do. Yes. Sounds like something humans might be able to learn from. <laughs> That's right. And, and so, you know, it's, it's typically found in areas um, that are, you know, some of those are sand hill areas, some of those are, are pine flatwoods, and uh, it can coexist, you know, pretty well in a, uh, an environment with uh, timber harvest, um, and uh, especially if that's, uh, that timber harvest is combined with uh, periodic fire, because what the gopher tortoise needs is a lot of, uh, you know, grassy and herbaceous uh, material that it can eat. So it needs groceries on the ground, essentially. Uh, when you have a really um, uh, fire-suppressed forest, you don't get that, that uh, cover of, of herbs that the gopher tortoise needs. So um, we're trying to work with um, private landowners to improve habitat for gopher tortoises, but we're also looking at areas that uh, can be acquired uh, by the state of Georgia or by conservation partners in the state to make sure that we have those populations healthy and, and, and increasing over time. And you mentioned the right whale. What is the state doing in terms of what, uh, maintaining habitat or? Well, the, off the coast of Georgia is the calving grounds for the northern right whale. So it's very important. This is um, uh, an area where we are uh, watching for the, the uh, whales when they migrate southward. and. Uh, one of the issues with right whales is um, periodic entanglement in, in long lines, for example, lines uh, from lobster pots, uh, lobster traps uh, up in the northeast. 
And um, occasionally our staff actually has to do, um, uh, get involved in a, in a disentanglement um, uh, activity and those are, those are pretty high tech and, and pretty exciting. Uh, uh, for the most part, we try to track those animals. Um, you know, uh, we, we note if there's a new calf that, you know, appears one year. And of course, there are lots of uh, other organizations up and down the Atlantic coast that are keeping an eye on those as well. So, so all of those whales are, are photographed, um, you know, so that they can be identified from boats and from airplanes. Um, and uh, the other concern uh, with the right whale is the possibility of boat collisions. So. Uh, we have uh, policies and regulations in place for boat traffic off the coast of Georgia so that these uh, boat operators uh, are aware of um, the right whales and can, you know, they're, they don't move very fast. So, <laughs> yeah, so you mentioned reptiles, yeah. whales, also birds. Is that included in the? We do. We, we do a lot of uh, monitoring of, of bird populations. The wood stork is a species that we've been uh, involved uh, in, in monitoring nesting success over the years, and, and it's a great uh, success story. It was recently downlisted from endangered to threatened status by the Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, the bald eagle in the state of Georgia is another great success story. It was actually uh, taken off the endangered species list entirely. We still uh, monitor nests around the state, and um, and, and you know, check to make sure that those those birds, you know, are still continuing to nest successfully and to to fledge their young. Your colleague who was interviewed earlier about the uh, coyote challenge mentioned that one of the reasons the coyote came into the state was the and I think I is the word extirpation maybe that's, that's, that's of, of the mountain lion as well as was the red wolf. Have those mm -hmm. populations uh, at all have been seen returning, or is that something that even be desired? Well, the, the red wolf is, is um, very much reduced. There are a few areas where it, you know, there, there are some populations that are being managed very carefully, none in Georgia. Um, the, uh, the, the eastern cougar is considered uh, essentially extinct uh, in, and was extirpated from Georgia, as far as we can tell, you know, decades ago. The Florida panther, of course, um, you know, it exists in Florida, and um, the population there is is growing slowly, um, but but is you know on the on the upturn. Um, let's let's flip over to the uh, native plant species that you're working with that are perhaps endangered or at mm -hmm. risk. Well, we work on uh, what we call species of conservation concern, whether they're. Uh, on the federal list, on the state protected species list, or just ones that we're tracking because we've got some um, concerns that they may be declining. Um, there's a, a plant called the Georgia Aster that we and, and several other organizations uh, worked on as a priority species over, the, over several years. It was another species that was um, considered for addition to the federal endangered species list. And we were able to, uh, to show that through additional surveys that we undertook that there were uh, a lot more of that, a lot more populations of that, that particular species um, in the state of Georgia and in other states. And that they were being conserved, they were being managed appropriately. Uh, and we, we actually uh, entered into what's called a candidate conservation agreement because the, the Georgia Aster was a candidate uh, to be on the, the federal endangered species uh, list. And th this conservation agreement actually uh, allowed us to uh, keep that species off the list because it's going to be taken care of by uh, a number of different organizations. So are, you, are you also, uh, I, I understand the hemlock has been under, um, uh, under duress and because of certain, is it a bug or what ha is, is that also an area that you're working on? Or? It, it's one where we've um, worked with groups like the, the uh, U.S. Forest Service and researchers from, from different universities. The uh, hemlock woolly adelgid is an insect that was introduced. It's kind of similar to an aphid and it, um, it's caused tremendous uh, loss of the eastern hemlock. And uh, 
there are some uh, predatory beetles that have been uh, introduced and have some success in terms of controlling the the uh, adelgid. And hopefully, it, they don't cause you know what is an unintended consequences or something. That's that's what you have to be very careful about. So I guess maybe this is self-evident to uh, you, me. But why should people, the general public, care? About, you know, sometimes it's like, oh, well, you know, I don't get out of nature. You know, I'm here with my whatever electronic device of, of choice. Why, why should we care? What, what do you tell people? <clears throat> well, I mean, uh, one thing, uh, and I guess it's kind of a point of pride uh, for Georgians, we are one of the most biologically diverse states in the nation. Um, and when you consider how many uh, states, especially out west, are larger, you know, than Georgia, it's, it's pretty impressive. We, and that diversity is due to the different uh, eco-regions, the different landscapes, uh, the different geology and different soils that we have. So we have everything from, you know, mountain bogs to, to the, you know, the coastal marshes. habitats, mm -hmm. marshes, the Okefenokee Swamp is a, is a huge uh, and, and diverse uh, system uh, unto itself. So, you know, it, our, our job in the Wildlife Resources Division is really to try to maintain that biological diversity, which we think is important because it, you know, it's, it, it gets to issues like quality of life. But it also, you know, when you have diverse, uh, well-functioning systems, you have a, you know, kind of a green infrastructure. You have support for, um, you know, clean water, clean air. What's your biggest fear, that that's at risk? Well, obviously, you know, we have um, uh, pressures from uh, growth in the state, and uh, we certainly, you know, are, are in favor of economic development, and, and our uh, aim really is to make sure that, that uh, the most sensitive habitats are not targeted for certain types of development. Uh, so, for example, um, you know, solar uh, energy is has really come on in the state, and uh, that's a good thing. It's great to have um, you know a clean energy source and have a diversification of energy uh, production in the state. But um, you know it makes a difference where uh, a large solar farm is is sited. You know. And thank you for talking to us about the uh, tax uh, form checkoff to save the wildlife and native plants here in Georgia. Dr. Jan John Ambrose, thanks for being with us at the table, and thank you for being with us. We'll see you next time. Take care.